Hello, I'm Sarah abdul and I'm the symposium editor of the Texas A&M Law Review. I'm joined today by fellow Law Review staffer Mark Gannon, Professor Riley, the Associate Director of the Aggie Dispute Resolution Program, and we're also honored to be joined by Professor Carrie Minkle Meadow, who is the Distinguished and and Chancellor's Professor of Law at UC Irvine and is one of the preeminent scholars and founders of the dispute resolution field. On March 20, sorry, on March 4th, 2022, the Law Review and the ADR program will be co-hosting a symposium entitled The Renaissance Woman of Dispute Resolution, Carrie Minkle Meadows' Contributions to New Directions in Feminism, Ethics, and ADR. We're excited to be able to have this conversation today with Professor Minkle Meadow herself as a bit of a preview to what we are sure will be an amazing event this spring. Um, so thank you so much, Professor Minkle Meadow, for being here. And uh, Professor, hearing you speak on that made me think about how students in uh, my and Sarah's generation can get involved in these sort of processes. To that end, I'd like to discuss your article on uh, the crisis in legal education. For me personally, and I'm sure many other young law students can relate to this, I grew up hearing the uh, cautionary tales that you discussed in your article, like, oh, don't go to law school, there are no jobs, the market's oversaturated, and so on and so forth. And so forth. So I'd just like to say uh, that it was very reassuring to read that there are alternatives out there. And I agree with you that I think schools need to do more to introduce students to these alternative paths, especially those that focus on justice and human needs, like you discussed. Um, I think A&M does a great job with that with our ADR program. Uh, the question I want to ask you, though, is that there seems to be a potential conflict between taking the time to properly introduce students to these alternative paths and properly preparing students to pass the bar exam. We only have three years after all here. How do you think law schools can strike a balance between these two goals? Oh, fabulous question to you guys. Um, yes, it's a conflict. Um, and I'm going to add a third part to that conflict question. Um, how do we introduce students to these important justice seeking and peace seeking at the same time uh, processes and how do we teach you how to negotiate and how to mediate and how to solve problems, which is what I care about, and also teach you property and contracts um, and civil procedure and criminal law. Um, how do we do all of that? And I want to add what I have perceived to be a conflict in legal education almost, you know, for, for me now, this is my 45th year of teaching, actually. I went to law school 40 something years ago. Um, and that is the tension between preparing people for the bar and to be lawyers by overemphasizing the old fashioned trial lawyer role. Um, so, you know, in any tip and, and law schools, I'll say to everyone is this, and you all know this legal education has not changed in 150 years. Since Langdell developed the case method at Harvard, um, we now have variations and, and a lot of change during COVID. I think there's a lot of a lot less nasty Socratic uh, putting people on the spot and a lot more didactic lecturing through Zoom and other way, in other ways. So it's become kinder in a way and less harsh on students. But there still is this notion that what lawyers do is argue and debate um, and that ultimately it's all going to wind up in a courtroom. Um, not even in a trial because most of your cases that you read are appellate cases. So you don't even learn that much about how to do a trial unless you take trial advocacy or a skills course later. So I think we actually have three conflicts going on in legal education. One is to prepare you for the skills, um, intellectual skills and the practice skills of creative problem solving, uh, working for clients, interviewing, counseling, being kind, as well as being rigorous and effective, uh, learning enough of the traditional law so you can pass the bar exam, and then, as I'm suggesting, realizing that everyone needs to learn a little bit. Everyone needs to study evidence, for example. Everyone needs to understand what's going to happen if a case goes to court. But to recognize, as I said in that article, that the numbers of you students out there that are actually going to be trial lawyers is pretty small. And clearly, there's nothing wrong with wanting to do that for all the would-be prosecutors and defense counsel on the criminal side and civil rights lawyers um, and uh, personal injury lawyers on the plaintiff side. Um, those are still very important functions, but they are not the only functions. 
And the trouble with law school is it is much too slanted um, towards certain kinds of practice and, those, and subjects that you have to study on the bar. So um, one quick answer to your question. It's, quick, it's a quick thing to say. It's a terrible thing to try to get done. I spent years in California, not recently, trying to get the bar exam changed. So um, that's one, one answer, one very concrete answer to your question would be, um, look at what Wisconsin does. Wisconsin does not require a bar exam for anyone who goes to law school in Wisconsin. So the students that go to Marquette or Wisconsin, if they get their degree in Wisconsin, no bar exam, automatically in the bar if you pass. That's true in a lot of countries. I have taught in Argentina, the same thing is true there. If you go to Argentina a law program, which by the way is undergraduate, five years, and then you do one year of apprenticeship and you pass all of that, you're a member of the bar. Oh, so imagine that. And why doesn't it happen? Because in the United States, the bar is an industry. Uh, the bar preparation uh, programs um, and the, the states that make you pay big fees to take the bar exam. So one part of your question, which you know isn't the highfalutin part, but very important practically, would be serious bar admission reform in the United States. And I sit in the state with the wor worst bar passage rate in the country. I mean, we pass the fewest students here in California. It's a very tough bar. When I took the attorney's exam in 1979, long time ago, only 23% um, of the lawyers who were lawyered in, who were barred in some other state passed. It was ridiculous. It is purely an exclusionary uh, process. And first time takers, um, it's been as low as 60% in recent years here in California. It's a big problem for us. I'm at a relatively elite fancy school where most people do pretty well, but we still have a, lot, a number of students that, pass, that don't pass the bar. And if they just cross state lines and took the state bar in Nevada or Washington state, they'd be members of the bar. So I wanna to say to you, you know, um, newer students, younger members of the bar, one thing you can do in your lives, wherever you practice is work on bar reform. Uh, it, it, I don't think a test, a, a test of two or three days tells you anything about how you're gonna practice. And then to answer your question where, you know, about your own lives, Balance, balance, balance. Um, so you put it very nicely, a conflict between, as you perceive it as a student, bar courses and more interesting or more skills or more Menkel Meadow creative problem solving classes. Um, I would tell every law student, no matter what, take property. Um, you'll be shocked to learn that property is not required at UCI. Uh, I, I'm founding faculty, but I wasn't part of that decision. Um, and as uh, progressive and problem solving as I am, Nobody should be a lawyer without taking property. Nobody should be a lawyer without taking contracts. Nobody should be a lawyer without taking constitutional law. Now, we get to civil procedure. I taught that for over 20 years. I would radically change, and I did when I taught at Georgetown, radically change that course. So that civil procedure could be a bar course teaching you what you need to know to do trials and to do discovery. But civil procedure is about civil litigation. And how do we solve those problems? These days, you file a case, the first thing you're gonna be asked in most state and federal systems is go to a settlement conference, try to mediate, try to work it out. If that doesn't work in many courts, you're gonna to have to go to arbitration or something else. ADR is absolutely, it's not, it's not alternative. It is, I call it dispute resolution. Other people call it appropriate dispute resolution. And here's a new one if you guys haven't heard it, we've all been talking about accessible dispute resolution. So if civil procedure taught these things, it would solve part of your problem. It would be in a bar course, and it would also be teaching you what you're most likely to do when you graduate, which is not try cases. I mean, be prepared to try them if you have to, but to use the other skills that lawyers need to actually be lawyers and to help clients solve their problems. And so, some of these important things that I teach um, and care about, I've enfolded into almost everything else that I teach. Um, and so you can take the bar courses and, and they need to be taken um, and they themselves could be redone so that they would include all these other things that we think is important. I think that's a fair point. And as sort of just a brief follow up to that, do you think that law schools also need to adapt their ethical training for students to prepare them for different careers. Absolutely. So 
Um, I'm glad you asked me that question. So I can say, in addition to feminism being my religion, my other religion is contextualism. I'm, I've been fighting for my entire academic career against, you know, essentially what's called black letter rules, you know, and I have a, uh, I have a short book coming out of negotiation in which one of my golden rules is never say never and never say always. Um, almost everything depends on the situation and the context. So despite the fact I said earlier that there are lines I won't cross and I have my own limits, I think most ethical decisions are situational um, and that uh, lawyers have different ethics in different contexts. And one of the concerns I have, it's interesting, at my school now, UCI, um, the, a course in the legal profession is required in the first year. And although I have been a scholar of the legal profession for over 30 years, I will not teach it in the first year. It's too early. So I taught legal profession at UCLA in the third year and at Georgetown for the most part. In the third year, when law students had been in summer practices and part-time jobs, um, legal ethics needs to be related to concrete decisions that lawyers make. I mean, you need to know the model rules of professional conduct and what those rules are, but they make no sense to you or to anybody unless you actually experience them in context. So um, when I started teaching legal profession at UCLA in 1983, I did it entirely through role plays and simulations um, and a text, uh, which I then was a co-author on for some years. I don't do that anymore. But the idea was every legal ethical rule should be experienced. And so before Law and Order, my class was ripped from the headlines. I wrote about 35 role plays for each class that had to do with real ethical dilemmas that lawyers faced in all kinds of practice, criminal practice, civil practice, organizational practice, labor organizing, Congress, uh, legislature. You know, you guys are in Texas. We don't want to talk about what's going on there right now with the legislature, um, being there, not being there. Um, these, are, these are important ethical questions uh, for legislators too. So um, ideally, um, okay. Um, I just, I'll say one final thing. Ideally on this subject, and um, we did a little of it at Georgetown before I left, we could have ethical one unit add-ons to particular subjects that you were either majoring in or that you cared about so that you would be learning ethics in context. Um, and I think it would stick more for all of you, for all of us, if the ethical choices and decisions and rules were learned in the context of how they actually come up in practice.